discovery by me of the South Est Archive has provided a snapshot of the antiquarian networks where information, ideas and resources were being shared. The archive provides new information and gives an insight into the methods being used to research and record information about antiquities in the area. Antiquarians also often relied heavily on local knowledge in various formats, from witness reports to authors, second-hand reports, hearsay, evaluated hearsay, folk song or oral tradition beyond living memory. And the South Esk archive evidences this. The ninth Earl of South Esk, James Carnegie, was a respected member of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland and an active correspondent on Pictish matters from 1880 until 1903. He produced many papers and books on the subject of Pictish stones and in particular the organ inscriptions of Scotland. The correspondence of Lord South S contains 1,404 pages in total. Lord South S corresponded with many of the key players in the field of Pictish studies, people such as J. Romilly Allen and Joseph Anderson. Major academics of the period, such as Professor Rees of Oxford and Professor G. F. Brown of Cambridge. The information contained within the letters covers Pictish stones from other areas of Scotland, but the focus of this talk will be on those letters relating to Aberdeenshire. In the 19th century, there was a surge in the number of clergy and schoolmasters taking up the hobby of antiquarianism. Amongst South Esk correspondents, there were eight members of the clergy. One prolific correspondent was the schoolmaster James Ritchie of Port Elphinstone, who was for many years a corresponding member of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland as well. South Esk also corresponded directly with landowners and farm farmers of the lands on which monuments stood. The South Esk archive also preserves a selection of letters from such people, uh, including Lord and Lady Contour of Keith Hall in Barudi and A.M. Gordon of Newton near Inverurie, where the famous Newton stone still stands. This archive covers a period which was pivotal in the study of Pictish stones, a time when there was growing interest and study of these monuments. This was a time when the transition from antiquarianism to archaeology was taking place, a time when scholars such as Joseph Anderson were taking a more scientific approach to the study and recording of antiquities, a time when papers on Pictish stones appeared regularly in publications such as the Proceedings of the Society of Antiquities. The correspondence of Lord South Esk of Kinnaird Castle, Brechin and County Angus lay unnoticed, even by his great-great-grandson for some 135 years until its discovery by me in 2011. A fire had devastated the castle in early November 1921 and destroyed many of the treasures of the family. Fortunately, the correspondence of South Esk had been stored in the charter room of the castle the only place that documents survived. A report in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 9th of November 21 reported that Kinnaird Castle in Forfarshire, the Earl of South Theft seat, has been destroyed by fire, which is believed was due to a heating apparatus, but the documents in the charter room were rescued. Since then, the letters and papers of Lord South Esk have been stored in boxes at Kinnaird Castle. Some months into my doctoral research, I came across a, re a reference in the PhD thesis of Dr. Catherine Forsyth to several letters written by Lord South Esk referring to organ inscriptions carved on a Pictish stone at Logie Elphinstone in Aberdeen, Shire, including one of these letters was from Romilly Allen to Joseph Anderson. It was these letters that first inspired me to investigate the possible antiquarian networks surrounding the study of Pictish stones of Scotland, if indeed there was such a ne network. The content of the letter from Rom Romilly Allen to Anderson mentioned the passing of information from one, to one person to another. It read, Allen, I enclose all the letters, etc. I have relating to the inscription so that you may be able to form an independent opinion. The seven letters 
by Lord Southwest to Romilly Island suggested that information was being transmitted to and from Aberdeenshire by way of this network of letters. In the introduction to the reprint of ECMS, Henderson notes that Romilly Island's first move after he was commissioned to carry out the project for the Society of Antiquities of Scotland was to do what John Stewart had done in 1856 and write to local archaeologists and antiquarians to collect information about the whereabouts of known monuments and also to collect any new information relating to monuments found since the writing of the Symbol Stones of Scotland. The following excerpt reflects this. I have been carefully considering your interesting letter of 19th and studying the tracings you have sent me from your own and Mr Payton's rubbings from the Logie Elphinstone Ogham. This ex excerpt confirms that the passing of ideas and items was taking place at a time when travelling was more difficult, therefore discussion by letter was one way to carry out research. This correspondence often included copies of rubber drawings, squeezes and the like being passed from one antiquarian to another along with their ideas and interpretations. A visit to the British Library to view the Romilly Allen collection of papers, letters and drawings increased my interest in the possible network that existed. That collection contained several letters written to Romilly Allen from local Aberdeenshire people, giving them information about stones in the area. Clearly, some sort of anti antiquarian network did exist in the Aberdeenshire area. And as many of the letters included ones to and from South Esk, it seemed likely that he would provide a good starting point to try to establish the extent of such a network. I contacted the commercial office at Kinnaird Castle, home of Lord South Esk, to inquire if they had an archive and was advised to send an email which would be passed on to the current Lord South Esk, who is now Duke of Fife. He replied and a visit was arranged and on Tuesday, the 8th of October, 2011, I visited Kinnaird Castle near Brechin in Angus, Scotland. I was hopeful that I might find one or two letters from Romilly Allen to South Esk to match the letters I already had. On arrival at the castle, the current Lord South Esk, Duke of Fife, showed me into a small room where I was presented with a large wooden tray loaded with bundles of letters. As I began began to look through them, I quickly realised the magnitude of the find. The archive contained many letters from Romilly Allen Joseph Anderson. Lord South Esk very kindly offered the services of his secretary to copy what I required, but given the number of letters in the collection, I sought his permission to make digital images of the letters and notes, and he kindly lent me a tripod to carry out the work. The photographs were taken over four visits in November and December of 2011. South Esk has never been the focus of research and its contribution to Pictish studies has been largely forgotten. However, the correspondence he preserved is ripe for research and provides some valuable information. Rosemary Sweet notes that in remembering earlier research, modern scholarship tends to cher cherry pick the most outstanding scholars. I would like to um, rectify the situation by placing South Esk alongside other important correspondence of the period. The South Esk archive is important because it offers a window into the antiquarian networks. The archive has been has preserved correspondence from some of the well-known scholars of the time, Professor Rees of Oxford, Romilly Allen, Joseph Anderson, and also a large number of letters from local interested men, such as A.M. Gordon of Newton and Aberdeenshire. The information contained in the letter sheds light on the methods used to study monuments during this period, as well as re revealing some hitherto unknown information about particular stones, such as the one at Brandsbutt in Aberdeenshire. Little information has been published surrounding the discovery of this stone, and the information contained within the South Esk collection will contribute significantly to our understanding of the biography of the stone. There is a myriad of other material supplying additional information for the biographies of specific inscribed Pictish stones throughout East Scotland. However, only 
the information relating to Aberdeenshire will be included here. Lord South Esk, um, hereafter South Esk, was born James Carnegie on the 16th of November 1827 in Edinburgh. He was the eldest child of Sir James Carnegie of Pitaro, 5th Barony, and his wife Charlotte. Educated at Edinburgh Academy and then at Sandhurst Royal Military College, South Esk was eventually commissioned in the Gordon Highlanders in 1845. In 1846, he transferred to the Grenadier Guards and on his succession to the 6th Baronet of Pitaro in 1849, he retired from the military. South Esk married Lady Catherine Hamilton Noel on the 19th of June, 1849, age 19. They had three daughters and one son. South Esk restored the family seat at Kinnaird Castle and began his collection of art and books. In 1855, um, South Esk made a claim to have the earldom of South Esk returned to his family. And on July 2nd that year, an act of parliament reversed, reversed the attendance of 1715 which had been a, a imposed as a, as a result of the 5th Earl of South Esk for his share in the Jacobite uprising of that year. Also in 55, South Esk was made Knight of the Thistle and given the, Balin, the Baron Ballenhard of Farnell. He was made a Knight of the Thistle on a recommendation of Gladstone, Prime Minister of the Day, and later that year he was made a Peer of the United Kingdom and given the title Balin, Baron of Ballenhard. Lady South Esk, the Countess died on the 9th of March, 1855, aged 25 years. This marked the beginning of a period of depression for Lord, Lord South Esk, which would see him look for relief in a seven month long trip to the Rocky Mountains in 1859 to 1860. On the 15th of April, 1859, he sailed from Liverpool on the Cunard steamer Africa. South Esk remarried in 1860 on his return from his Canadian trip. He married Lady Susan Catherine Mary Murray, daughter of Alexander Edward, 6th Earl of Dunmore, and they had three sons and four daughters. South Esk then continued his lifelong hobby of collecting antique gems, books, paintings, and Middle Eastern cylinders. Whilst in Canada, South Esk collected probably one of the most important collections of Canadian Indian goods to survive. His grandson, the Duke of Fife, sold a majority of the collection to the Royal Alberta Museum at an auction at Sotheby's in 2006. Um, he also donated a further six items to that museum. The objects in the collection are both rare and significant. Whilst in Canada, South S kept a daily journal, um, which has provided a commentary on his meetings and travels. Many of the antiquarians of the period were literary men, and South Esk was the author, author of several works, amongst them such titles as Herminius, a romance published in 1862, The Burial of Isis in 1884. Professor Rees described him as having a tendency towards myth and mysticism. South Esk's long interest was, however, the Pictish stones of Scotland, and in particular the symbols and the Ogham inscriptions. He published papers in 1884 and 1885 in the Proceedings of the Society of, Scot Society of Antiquities of Scotland, and in 1893 he published a book titled The Origins of Pictish Symbolism. South Esk was given an honorary LLD of St Andrews in 1872 and of Aberdeen University in 1875. He died on the 21st of February 1905. He left him behind him a rare collection of correspondence in this archive. The remainder of this talk will be about the Brandsbutt Stone, um, of which I have several, well, quite a number of letters. Um, this is one or two of the items that were sold by Sotheby's to the museum in Alberta, um, commissioned by South Esk to bring home as presents, but they lay in the castle and obviously were taken great care of because they're in magnificent condition. As a curator, that interested me. Um, so, um, 
the discovery of the Pictish symbol stone at Brandsbutt in Aberdeenshire. The Brandsbutt stone is a class one Pictish symbol stone bearing two large symbols and an organ inscription. It's situated in the centre of a housing estate in the important Donside town of Inverurie. To date, little information has been published surrounding the stone's discovery. New information in the letter archives of James Carnegie, Lord South Esk, um, contributes to our understanding of the biography of the stone. It gives us an insight into the exchange of information taking place between amateur antiquarians and academics at a formative period in Pictish studies. And here's Inverurie and the place where you'll find the Pictish stone uh, in the centre of the town. Inverurie is a major town in one of the most fertile and strategically important areas in Aberdeenshire, an area known as the Giri. The early importance of the area is also reflected and the evidence that exists for a Roman marching camp close by at the site of Logie Durnell and a Roman road passing through what is now part of the modern town. The area remained strategically significant from the Pictish period right into the Middle Ages when the Battle of Harlow was fought in 1411. The importance of the area in the medieval period is highlighted by the Morton Bailey known as the Bass, which is situated on the confluence of the Don and the Uri. The Royal Borough of Inferiori was founded by Errol David of Huntingdon after his elder brother William the Lion granted him the Lordship of the Giri in 1178, probably a reflection of the importance of the area in an early period. The name Brandsbutt is a combination of the surname Brand and the old Scots word butt, which means a measure of land less than a brick. Only one Pictish stone was recovered on this site but it is possible that there were originally a group of stones at that site. There are many existing symbol stones um, that are found in clusters, such as the ones at Dice, Tilly Tarman, Inveravon, and Logie Elphinston, and Briney. There are more symbol stones in the immediate vicinity of Brunsbutt. A fragment of a symbol stone survives as a lintel over a window at East Balhalgerdi, also spelled East Balhagerdi, a place name meaning the priest's residence just across the river from Brunsbutt. The exact spot where the symbol stone originally stood is unknown, but it is assumed that it was close to the present site. Pictish stones are often linked to small knolls in the landscape, and at Brunsbutt there is such a knoll which stands 91 metres above sea level. It seems plausible that the symbol stone could have stone stood on a small hill to make it more visible. At the point of its inception, the stone must have been an object of high status, representing a sizable social, economic and... Oh, sorry. Um, representing a sizable... Um, oh. Uh, social, economic, and probably a political investment. It is likely that the symbol stone was highly, highly regarded by the carver uh, and its owner, who were possibly one and the same. The Pictish stone is roughly triangular block measuring three foot six inches high and four feet two inches wide. Um, it is carved from Quinn stone and bears two Pictish symbol symbols, the crescent and v-rod above a serpent and z-rod, and it also has an ogham inscription incised using the pock and groove method. It may have been part of a larger stone, possibly containing more Pictish symbols. Ian Shepherd suggested that the stone originally came from a stone circle, which he confirmed had stood close by. The reuse of stones taken from prehistoric stone circles Circles occurs at other sites. One example is Meagle number one, which has Pictish symbol carved onto a Bronze Age cup marked standing stone. It is also possible that it stood near the site of a stone circle, like, um, like the Pictish stone at Daviot. The earliest scholarship um, to the important Pictish stone at Brandsbutt appears in the six inch ordinary ordnance survey map on sheet 54, dated 1866 67. The entry for Brands but read this stone is built into a stone dike near Brands but nothing is known respecting it. 
the sculpturing is very indistinct and difficult to trace. The dike marked the boundary between the Bransbury estate owned by Lord Cantor of Keith Hall and Stonefields, a name which reflects the fact there had been a stone circle on this site. Um, the following drawing is also contained within the OS notebook. Um, it, it contains a sketch of the stone at Bransbutt. Um, the next reference to the stone appears in 1878 in a book titled Inverurie and the Earldom, penned by the Reverend Doctor, which makes reference to these are, there are sculptures stone at the Fort of the Dawn and at Bransba and near Drimmies and the famous maiden stone of Benahy. Um, Davidson gives no descriptive information regarding the stones or their carvings, suggesting that he has limited interest in them. In 1901, the Bransbutt stone was brought under notice by F.R. Coles in the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. F.R. Coles was the assistant keeper of the Museum of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. Initially, he was commissioned by the Society of Antiquities of Scotland to record, measure and draw all the stone circles in the region surrounding the River Dee and Bankery in Aberdeenshire. The survey was financed using money provided by the Gunning Fellowship, which also funded the project on early Christian monuments of Scotland undertaken by Allen and Anderson. In 1902, Coles was awarded the Gunning Fellowship again to continue his work on stone circles in the area surrounding the River Don. And one site that interested him was a site at Bransbutt, where part of a stone circle had been recorded. It was during this work that Coles attempted to find the sculptured stone recorded in six inch ordnance survey. As well as recording the stone circles, Coles collected oral traditions in the area, although he doesn't mention any tradition of there being a stone in the wall at Inverurie. Um, in his report on the stone, Coles records the date when the stone was eventually found. He wrote on re visiting the site on September 3rd, 1901, to see whether a sculpture stone marked on the OM as being in the dike to the south of the angle was still there. My driver, Mr. Frank Day, detected marks upon a stone half buried in the dike, about 40 feet south of the angle. On cleaning the surface, I found it to be a sculpture stone of the early type with incised symbols, showing part of a serpent with the angularly bent rod across its body. And what is still more interesting, a portion of an Ogham inscription. A notice of this stone, which seems to be still undescribed, will be given subsequently. The find by Frank Day initiated a period of intense interest and correspondence about the brand's book sculptured stone, culminating in the discovery, the recovery of more of the fragments, which revealed the remaining symbol and the rest of the Ogham inscription. The groundbreaking work, Early Christian Monuments of Scotland, published in 1903 by Anderson and Allen, provides the next record of the Bransbutt stone. The volume included an appendix detailing only those stones found or recovered since the completion of field visits. The discovery of the first fragment of the Bransbutt stone was timely and gave Anderson and Allen the opportunity to include this exciting new find in the appendix to the catalogue of known Pictish stones in Scotland. The picture, which was finally included in ECMS, shows three fragments of the stone. This, however, was not what Anderson first intended. Letters written by Joseph Anderson to Lord South Esk record that the initial intention was to publish a picture of the first fragment of the stone found by Frank Day. Presumably the delay in the publication of ECMS until 1903 meant that they were able to include further fragments that had been found during the interim period. The relevant correspondence from the South East Archive, recently discovered at Cape Kinnaird Head, covers the period from the 3rd of December 1902 to the 19th of November 1903 and contains 26 letters, which relate directly to the discovery of the Bransbutt Stone. The letters were all written to Lord South Esk, <clears throat> who was a keen antiquarian and the author of several works on Pictish stones. The authors of these 27 letters include some eminent academics and antiquarians of the time, Anderson of ECMS, um, 
co-author of the Ehrlich, first published in 1903. There are also a number of letters from Professor Rees, um, other in, uh, authors include James Ritchie, photographer, amateur antiquarian, and school teacher from Port Elphinstone, who would become a correspondent bonding member of the Society of Antiquities. Um, also included were Lord and Lady Contour of Keith Hall Estate in Inverurie, J.W. Sanford Thomas, the factor to the estate of Lord Contour. In this paper, I will summarise the recovery of the brands, but still using books from the letters. The correspondence will also highlight the antiquarian networks which were in existence in Aberdeenshire at this time. The presentation of the letters will be in approximate chronological order and will illustrate the pivotal role played by South Esk in facilitating the recovery of the remaining fragments of the Brandsbutt stone and in the preservation of this information for scholars of today. Without his interest in Pictish stones and Ogham inscriptions, this information would most certainly not have survived. Joseph Anderson wrote a number of letters to South Est concerning the Brandsbutt stone, the first of which was written on the 3rd of December, 1902. He wrote, I now include a proof of the appendix to the book on the early Christian stones of Scotland, which contains the Ogham at Inverurie. The proof is uncorrected as to letterpress, but the figures are as they will appear. I, will, I have been longer in getting it from the printer than expected. In the period between Anderson's first letter of the 3rd of December and his next one of the 15th of December, South Esk received a letter from James Ritchie with photographs of the Brandsbutt stone. Ritchie, who taught at Port Elphinston School, was a keen antiquarian and he published many articles on local antiquities in the proceedings. An archive containing photographs taken by Ritchie of Pictish stones and other antiquities in Aberdeenshire area is currently held at Arkham's in Edinburgh. The letter written by Ritchie is dated 12th of December 1902. And South Esk records on the top of the letter that he answered it on the 14th of December, the day before he received the next letter from Anderson. In his letter to South Esk, Ritchie enclosed copies of photographs of stones which he noted were taken since I sent you the Newton photographs some years ago. He includes one of the Brandsbutt stone and writes that it does not appear to be so well known as it deserves to be outside of our own immediate neighbourhood. Perhaps you may not have a photograph of it. Ritchie is keen to receive a reading of the Ogham inscription on the stone from South Esk and writes that he hopes it may help to throw some light on the meaning of these puzzling symbols which occur so frequently on the sculptured stones of this district. South Esk then sent the photograph to Anderson, who wrote back quickly to say, I am greatly obliged for yours of yesterday's date and for the photo, which shows unmistakably that the drawing is wrong. Would you ask Mr Ritchie's permission to use the photo? In the same letter, Anderson first mentions the possibility that other parts of the stone were in the dike. Mr. Coles says there are larger stones in the hero. Mr. Coles says there are larger stones in the dike, which look as if they belong to the same grain of granite stone, so that a search might probably produce more of the organ. Anderson notes, however, that he does not know who is the proprietor, but suggests that Ritchie will know. Oral tradition had preserved knowledge of a stone in the wall at Brandsbutt. James Ritchie came across this tradition when he was making inquiries in the local area about the stone. He records this information in a letter written on December 16, 1902 to South Esk. He wrote, I have made inquiries at all in the neighbourhood who, as far as I could discover, were likely to know anything about it. Several of the older folks knew of the stone in the wall, but no one had ever seen or heard of any other stone with any kind of markings on it. South Esk had already written to Ritchie to inquire as to the ownership of the land on which the wall stood. And on the 16th of December, Ritchie informs him that the farm of Bransbach is the property of the Earl of Contour. Ritchie spent much of his time trying to find the missing parts of the stone. He writes, I have several times made a rough examination of the wall itself, without, however, interfering with it in any way. 
but have as yet failed to find in any trace of the missing part. I think that its inscribed face must be turned inwards. There are several large stones in the foundation of the wall, not far from the inscribed ones, but these I am afraid are likely to be of the remains of an old sto stone circle, which at the time stood in the corner of the field close to the sculpture stone, but which has now been cleared away. The correspondence between Ritchie and South Esk proved provided in-depth information regarding the Ogram inscription on the Brandsbutt stone. In 1902-03, the possibility of travelling to see the stone every time a question arose would have been difficult, lengthy and expensive. The information passed between South Esk and other antiquarians would be shared across a wide network of amateurs and academics. Contact with Ritchie allowed South Esk to have particular questions answered as they arose in his mind. He wrote to Ritchie with lists of questions many times, some his own and some from Professor Rees of Oxford. Building relationships with local interested parties, living in the local area of particular stones was something which Anderson tried to promote. In a letter dated 11th February 1903, he seeks the help of South Esk to enrol Ritchie as a corresponding member of the Society of Antiquities of Scotland. He wrote, Dr. Christensen has suggested that Mr. Ritchie might be made a corresponding member of the Society as some recognition of his interest in antiquities and that you might not be disinclined to be his pro proposer. Corresponding membership does not involve any payment of fees and is more an honorary distinction or recognition than anything else. Anderson shared his views with South Esk on the encouragement of local enthusiasts in the same letter when he wrote, it is a useful thing to affiliate to the society men who are taking an active interest in local or general antiquities. I enclose a form of proposal, and if you will return it to me signed either as proposer or seconder, Dr. Christensen will also sign it and procure the third signature. Ritchie responded favourably to the invitation to become a corresponding member of the society. And um, on the 11th of July, 1903, he wrote, I feel I must express my thanks to you for the honour you have done me in proposing me as a member of the society. I shall do what little I can to further the objects for which the society exists. Clearly, Anderson's inclination to involve interested parties in the local area of monuments worked. In an effort to encourage a search for the missing fragments of the stone, South Esk wrote to Lord Contour to ask for his assistance. As the owner of the land on which the wall stood, Contour was the owner of the stone in the wall, or so they thought. On the 19th of December, South Esk received a letter um, of reply from Kintour. Despite knowing about the stone in the wall, Kintour had never launched a search for it. In a letter he writes, my dear Lord South Esk, I have long known about the stone at Brandsburg and I'm, glad, I'm very glad you as a great authority have been interested in it. He goes on to say, I have written to Mr. Sanford Thompson asking him to put himself in communication with you and instructing him to carry out such wall demolition as is required at my expense. I hope that something may result from it, but I am sure you will understand that I am averse to any fragments being removed from this site. I am trying to recover from from an average nine hour day in the House of Lords all last week. We prorogued happily today. Poor Alex Carnegie, I was so grieved to hear of his death with all best Christmas wishes. It is interesting to note that both the crofter and Lord Contour had known of the stone in the wall for some time, but had not tried to recover it. Despite this, they both seem to value ownership of any fragments of stone that may be recovered and are both averse to the removal. Um, the question of cultural ownership has been experienced by archaeologists working on other sites. Contour sent the letter from South Esk on to Sanford Thompson, solicitor and factor of the estates of, of Lord Contour. On the 20th of December 1902, Sanford Thomas wrote to South Esk the following letter. My Lord 
Lord Contour has asked, has sent me your letter to him, re a stone with an ogham inscription built in at one of the walls of the steading at Brands Butt, and has asked me to put myself in communication with your lordship. He goes on to write, I hope to be at Keith Hall on Wednesday 24th and will be very pleased to carry out any instructions you may give me. In the meantime, I will ask Mr Ritchie if he can meet me at Bransbutt on Wednesday. I am yours obedient, your obedient servant, J.W. Sanford Thompson. Ritchie was unable to make this meeting and he wrote back on the 23rd of December to say, um, I had a letter from Sanford Thompson asking me to meet him at Brandsbutt on Wednesday, which I regret I am able to I am unable to do as I shall be in work in school that day. I have, however, written to him explaining what needs to be done in order to discover, if possible, the missing portion of the stone. Um, as the man on the ground, Richie played a key role in the discovery process. He spent much of his time trying to locate other fragments in the wall, but without success. Also in the letter of 23rd December, he wrote, Sir, I went to Bransbutt on Saturday 20th and spent nearly the whole day looking in the dike for the upper part of the sculpture's stone. But I am sorry to say without success. I do not think there is any chance of getting it without taking down and rebuilding the wall in the neighbourhood of the stone. It is only a dry stone dike, so that no harm could be done by so doing if a skilled diker were employed. Sanford Thompson's visit to Brandsburg began the process of the discovery. Over a nine-day period, further fragments of the stone were recovered. The ability to date the exact day when each of the fragments of a Pictish stone was found is highly unusual in this period. It gives a unique insight into the biography of the stone at Brandsburg. The preservation of this information in letters which have survived for over 100 years at Kinnaird Castle gives a chance to witness the teamwork that went into finding and recording the Pictish stones during the 19th century. Ritchie kept South Esk informed of progress and a letter was sent on the 27th of December 1902. It's it is very likely that South Esk had wanted to be there while the wall was taken down. When the letter finally arrived at Kinnaird Castle from Ritchie, it stands out as one of the most exciting letters South Esk had received from him. The top of the letter is covered with annotations with red ink, crosses and underlines, marking out areas which he saw as the most important. Ritchie writes, the Earl of Contour's workmen under charge of Mr Brown have been examining the Bransbutt Dyke for the past few days with some success. Yesterday, the 26th of December, they found the part of the sculpture stone marked A on the accompanying rough sketch. And today, um, we found the part B, which exactly fits into the space between the original part and that found yesterday. There is still a portion of the upper part missing for the stem line of the organ seems, um, for the stem line of the organ seems runs right up to the broken edge of the stone. This part, however, we hope to find when work is resumed on Monday. Both the newly found portions were got in the foundations of the dike, not far from the previously known part, and both had the carved face of the stone turned downwards so that they could not have been discovered without pulling down the dike. Besides the serpent, a part of the crescent ornament appears on the stone. I have carefully copied the organs so that you may trust my drawing of them. I did not think it necessary to photograph the stone again until the search is complete. The dike forms a boundary between Brandsbach and Croft of Stonefield, probably named after the stone circles, which must have been there prior. The letter included a drawing of the stone with all the fragments in place, and it's most certainly the first drawing of the stone at Bransbach in its more complete state. The first drawing done by Coles only showed the first piece retrieved from the dike. As was his habit in correspondence, um, South Esk added a translation of the Ogham script in pencil, as well as dating the find to December 1902. And he also completed the crescent and virod in pencil. Um, he writes, another fragment completing the cre crescent since found on January 6, 1903. 
recording the date at which the last piece of the crescent was recovered. Sanford Thomas wrote to South Esk on the 3rd of January 1903. In the letter, he tells South Esk that the ownership of the stone was in question and South Esk must have felt mild or even severe panic that the stone may have to be built back into the wall. He wrote, I was at Bransbutt yesterday and I'm glad to inform you that the workmen have succeeded in finding three per further portions of the Ogham stone. I enclose a rough sketch of the stone as now put together. The three portions found are shown by crosses. There is still a small portion at the top where marked A missing, but I do not expect it is of much consequence. I may have to rebuild the hole into the garden wall again into the wall again, as the owner of the adjoining croft or farm is somewhat jealous of his rights. I presume your Lordship would like a photo of the stone as restored. A photograph survives at that point in the archive. The back of the photograph records that, um, that it records the portions discovered in December 1903. On the 5th of January, Richie informs South Esk, I'm sorry to say that since I wrote to you last, no additional part of the inscription has been found at Brandsbutt, but we got part of the right hand side of the stone with the remainder of the crescent and symbol on it. This makes certain that they were not ogums on the right hand side of the symbols. The missing part of the ogums, as well as the missing curve of the serpent, appears to have been on small pieces splintered off by the blasting of the stone. During the taking down and rebuilding of the wall, all the pieces have been carefully examined, but no trace of either of these markings has been discovered. Ritchie includes interesting detail in his letter about the processes used at the time he writes. The workmen say that it is the usual custom to throw the smaller fragments into the hole left by the removal of the stone that has been blasted and they seem to be of the opinion that this has in all probability been done in this case so it would be interesting to try and have the post holes excavated to see if indeed the missing fragments could be recovered. Richie carried out a large amount of research in the local area and the following excerpt from the same letter he writes, confirms that. Unfortunately, no one now living knows where the stone originally stood, so we don't know where to look. I have, however, asked the provost and town clerk of Embury to ascertain, if possible, if the position of the stone before it was broken up is marked on any old map in the borough, and I hope to hear the result of the search in a few days. Richie records that nothing was found in the borough records. Um, he, ha he also has an interest in the linguistic aspect of the Ogham inscription on the stone, and he spends time trying to work out how much, if any, of the inscription is missing. He wrote, I think we have some slight indication from what, what remains that, might help, that may help to indicate within narrow limits what letters are likely to follow the known ones. Um, I think there is hardly is room even for a vowel line. So he goes on to talk uh, some more about uh, the Ogham inscription. The strength of the networks that existed at the time is clear when Richie suggests that South Esk should send a copy of the inscription as it stands to some of the Irish antiquities who have had, antiquarians who have had considerable experience in deci deciphering Ogham's. They might be able to give some hint which might lead to the solution of the puzzle. The same letter shows that Richie was uncertain at this point whether the symbols were Christian or pagan. He hopes, I do not feel so sure as I once did that the symbols which occur so frequently on the sculptured stones in our neighbourhood are entirely pagan ones. At least the, the presence of some of them on undoubtedly Christian monuments as at a boing and dice would seem to indicate that the ideas symbolised were not inconsistent with Christianity. If this Brandsbutt inscription could be satisfactorily translated, it might solve the difficulty. Sidney Contour um, was not the only person to pay um, uh, a call. She also, she was the wife of uh, Lord Contour and um, she goes to visit, um, sorry, I've got muddled up somewhere. Um, so I'll go back a bit. Let's 
Sydney Controller was not the only person to pay a call to the crofter who owned part of the boundary wall. Richie also reports that when I heard that the proprietor of Stonefields was inclined to resent interference with the stone, I called on him and talked the matter over with him. I do not think he will cause any trouble if he be assured that it is not intended to take the stone away. He seems to be interested in it and was afraid when he saw the workmen um, but they were, they, that, that they were about to take um, the stone away from this place. Information and recorded, was recorded and passed from people on the ground like Richie Kintour and Sanford Thomas and sent directly to South Esk, who then disseminated it to other ac academics and archaeologists such as Anderson and Professor Rees of Oxford. Some of the information eventually made its way into the publication of ECMS. On receipt of the letter from Richie telling him of the discovery of other fragments of the stone, South Esk immediately wrote to Anderson and his reply came back from him on the 30th of December 1902. He wrote, I am delighted to hear that you have succeeded in finding more of the Ogham stone and hope that a further search may result in the recovery of the whole of it. The proof I sent you is part of the appendix to the work on ECMS, which the Society is about to issue as a separate publication. It has already accepted the appendix of stone discovered since 1892. He notes there has been no description of the Bransbat stone in the proceedings, merely a few lines in Mr Cole's report in the last issued volume of the proceedings, page 230, mentioning that he had discovered the portion of the stone in the dike. A detailed description of the stone and its inscription should be given in the proceedings, and I will hope you will be able to do this before the end of the present section that it may come into the current volume, it would be an appropriate supplement to your former papers on Yogam inscriptions. This correspondence preserved in South Esk archive provides information illustrating that the discovery of the Brandsbutt stone did not go altogether smoothly. The owner of Stonefields expressed his anger at the prospect of the stone being removed and he questioned the ownership of it. Letters from Richie and from Lady Sydney Contour confirmed that they intervened in the situation, but ultimately it was an exchange of money which settled the argument of the ownership of the stone. The following correspondence lays out the series of events that took place. On December 27th, 1902, Lady Sidney Kintour wrote to South Est to tell him she had been on a visit to Bransbach to see the stone. She writes, Kintour forwarded me, forwarded me your letters about the stone as he was going to Paris, and I was very grateful to him, as it gives me the opportunity of wishing you and Lady South Esk every possible good wish for the new year. And also of doing a tiny service to an old friend. J.W. Thompson is a worthy creature in many ways, but when the Mason came to see me and said Sanford Thompson had told him to go and pull down a wall at Bransbutt, I thought I would go up and see. And I arrived on the scene more or less at the right moment. It appears that the fragment of stone was built into the boundary wall, and I was tackled by an enraged individual who asked by whose authority the march fence was being tampered with. I administered pro promptly a large dose of soothing mixture and we are now the best of friends and prepared to walk hand in hand over the ruins until we are quite sure that everything has been searched. Meanwhile, I'm doubtful if the stone can be said to belong to Contour at all, for my new friend says it is mentioned in charters which go with the croft in the next field, over the boundary in fact. The stone has been a very large one and has been cruelly ill-used. Cartridges of bullets have been put right through it in several places, apparently to reduce it into blocks for wall building. While I was there, they found buried another large block in the left-hand corner, which is a continuation of the inscription, and at the bottom right, the beginning of the, the inscription. They are now propped up in the field and they're going to dig if to see if the missing bits can be found or even part of it. But as regards recovering it, I think sleeping dogs had better lie for at least the moment. I will tell Contour as soon as I see him. When I tell you that Duchess Blair was our neighbour there this summer and report that she had bought it, you will understand why I'm so hastily held out the olive branch uh, to the change de fer. Do you know 
you were the first person who interested me in these stones at all. I have a large number of acquaintances in the neighbourhood and wherever I can, I always have them carefully guarded. Perhaps one day you would come and see them when it is warm enough to make the driving pleasant and it would feel like the old days of Fivey Castle and its happy memories. Contour hopes to return next week. Meanwhile, with renewed good wishes to you and yours, very sincerely, Sydney Contour. The dispute over ownership was eventually resolved the following year. Richie writes to say, there is very little to report about the Brands But Stone since I wrote last. Some time ago, an agreement was arrived at by which the proprietor who claimed a share of the stone gave up his claim to the Earl of Kintour, the Earl of Kintour for a money payment. Since then, to allow of agricultural operations, the stone has been removed from its temporary site to the corner of the field, not far from where its various parts were found. Sadly, we are not told what amount of money changed hands between Lord Kintour and the crofter. South Esk maintained considerable correspondence with many academics over a number of years. One of his most prolific was Professor Rees of Oxford. In a letter dated 13th January 1903, Reese wrote, My Lord, yours is the only New Year's gift I have had this year, and I should have written sooner to thank you for it, but I have been down with bronchitis. So um, the South Esk Archive, um, he also writes in the same letter um, uh, uh, that he's comparing um, McAllister's account. And so... It, it, each of the letters gives us an insight into the many people that were corresponding about different inscriptions. The South Esk archive contains many letters from um, Rees of Oxford, and the date range goes from 1891 to 1903, um, and uh, so a number of years. It is pertinent to include a selection of this correspondence um, in, in on the symbols, brands, but symbol stone. Um, on February 12th, 1903, Reese writes, may I congratulate you heartily on your discovery of such a remarkable inscription and everyone who is interested in the ancient stones of Scotland must feel as I do. Very grateful um, to you for having the fragments of the stone brought to light in an attempt to resurrect his previous failed theories um, Reese writes, in case other explanations fail in the matter of the Ogham, may I be allowed to return to my discredited theory that Pictish was a language closely akin to Basque and to offer you the following conjecture. He then goes on to discuss the inscription and possible theories using the photograph and sketch he was sent by South Esk. Um, this paper clearly shows the level of information that may be lost regarding the majority of Pictish stones which were recovered during the 19th century. The discovery by me um, of the South Esk archive sheds light not only on the Brandsbatt stone and its biographical information, but also on the network of antiquarians and academics played out in Aberdeenshire. It also gives us the opportunity to see in action some of the methods used to record and share information at a time when transport and communication was considerably more limited than it is today. The photographs and drawings found in the archive are also unique and unpublished, many of them, and the discussions between academics and, and amateur antiquarians are fascinating. This archive will be a mine of information for scholars across various disciplines when it becomes fully avail available for study. Thank you very much for listening, and I don't think that that's the first piece of the stone that was ever found and the photograph was taken by Ritchie and sent to South Esk. And interestingly, as a, um, a, a, um, the executive in charge of the Museum of Scottish Lighthouses, I found this. Um, the South Esk School, and it has a lighthouse on it. And I thought that just brings together beautifully my two main interests in life, lighthouses and Pictish stones and Lord South Esk. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I hope I didn't run over. No, that, that was great. Thank you. That was a really fascinating talk. Uh, if you've got any questions, if you want to put them into the chat, I've got a few questions now, and um, we've got a little bit of time. So if you want to put any questions in, uh, I will ask them as, as we go through. Uh, we have one or two questions. Uh, one of them was actually about the archive. Are the letters part of a private archive at Kinnaird House 
or are they actually accessible by the public? Um, I have um, digitised, um, photographed digitally all of the archive and I have now transcribed it and um, I hope to make it available on a, an online search, searchable database. Okay. Uh, is there any questions to come forward? If not, I've got one or two of my own. Uh, you mentioned about the, the croft that was mentioned at the stone in, in one of the adjoining crofts. I'm just wondering, has anyone looked into that to find out its location of the original? I think my video is, is taking up bandwidth with Ryan. Okay, okay. Well, I'll turn it off. Yeah, go. Uh, yeah. Oh, Linda, you mentioned about the, the croft, that the adjoining croft said that the ownership of the stone may well have been theirs. It was in their deeds. Has anyone looked into, into those deeds to find out the original location for the... Um, Richie, uh, I don't know um, whether anyone's looked at the charters. I haven't. Um, that would be an interesting thing to do. Um, I think Richie may have done it. Okay, okay. Uh, and I'm sure South Est did, uh, Kintour did before he parted with money. Yes. <laughs> Almost certainly. <laughs> um, there was, let's have a look, that was the Croft. Uh, uh, one of my questions was, uh, linking into the lost northern se top section of the stone, I take it that nobody's done a further search for that? Um, I think um, uh, Shepherd um, did excavate one or two of the post holes to establish the exact position of the stone circle. But I don't think all of the post holes have ever been excavated. And it would be interesting if they did had backfilled them with parts of the stone, because I think there is quite a bit more of that stone. Probably will, really would be interesting. Uh, have you, has anyone got any questions to come through? Well, I've got, a, I've got another one. I'm just wondering, antiquarians often get a bad press, uh, from myself included. Uh, from your talk there, it seems that the antiquarians were, were an integral part of further research at this particular time. And what, what's your view of the antiquarians' impact on, on the research of the Pictish stones? I think overall? they made a, a considerable impact um, on the studies of Pictish stones and what they recorded, um, uh, you know, had they not been doing this and had I not found such an archive and there are many other books and papers written in the Society of Antiquaries by antiquarians of the time in this transitional period so I, I think they made a huge impact and they've left us a lot of um, information and documentation to help us in the study of students and it's interesting sometimes to go back over I think died he died in 1905 and ECMS had been published in 1903. So as Ro Rosemary Sweet said, um, uh, you know, che people often cherry pick the people they want to, to um, talk about and write about. And Romilly Allen and Joseph Anderson were such, they exploded onto the scene with ECMS in 1903. And then South Esk became ill the following year and died. And so, you know, he, he fades into insignificance and was seen as a bit of an upcase, I guess. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but I don't think he was. Um, I, I think he, he made a significant contribution. And I mean, I have letters in the archive from all over the east of Scotland, north as well. And so there is a lot of information there. I've got a question here. Uh, has the Ogham been translated? Uh, Yes, um, it was um, in Catherine Forsyth's PhD. Um, she's given a translation um, of it. And Richard, oh gosh, if I can remember Richard's second name, Richard Cox, I think, um, he, he translated it differently. Um, uh, but Catherine Forsyth's translation of it is Erata Doran's. Mm -hmm. So you can find it in her PhD work in 1996. Uh, just a question about a possible book on Scottish history and roots of Scottish history. You, anything you would recommend? Oh, gosh. Um, about Pictish stones? Or... I, would, I, will, I would hope so it would be, yeah. 
early Scottish history. I mean, the Pictures big... Stones of Aberdeenshire, there are many books um, that, that you could look at. Um, Gordon Noble's um, latest book, uh, King, King the North, I think that's a good one, and it gives you a good overview of, and, and it's current. Okay, uh, there's a question, could you repeat the Forsyth translation? Errata Dorans. Is there any more questions? Ah, oh, there's a question here. Uh, has the stone been associated with the biblical rod of Aaron, a symbol of power, and turn it into a serpent, or has it uh, been ruled out? Um, well, I think I would, I don't think it has anything to do with a biblical rod. But I'm sure there are other people that, that do. <laughs> right. Well, if, if there's no more questions, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. And if uh, you would like to show your appreciation, that'd be, be fantastic.